April. We're halfway through the month, believe it or not, and tax day 2024 has come and gone. I hope you filed your taxes. I hope you got some money back. But today I plan on talking about how your government keeps spending your money, and we need to talk about Mark Driscoll, who discerned an ashram spirit at a Christian men's conference in Springfield, Missouri. Crazy news for the extra content, but let's talk about taxes and money and your government wasting it tonight. Your favorite night of the week, the deep end of the match, live. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome in for episode 21 of season seven on The Deep End here on Tim Hatch Live. Just want to make sure that we're all familiar with this phrase. This content is for educational purposes only. So when I use clips or videos from other outlets, it is so that I can tell you how to discern the times in which we live through a biblical worldview. A quick reminder, too, about some channel news or Tim Hatch Live news. We are on television networks across America, GEB, World Harvest Television, NRB TV, and The Walk Sunday. So if you have any of those channels on your dial, tune in at those appropriate times. I look forward to bringing the word to you through that medium. Now, usually on the deep end, what I do is I talk about all the things that are bad in the world, and then I depress you for a half an hour or 45 minutes, at least for the free content. But tonight, I am going to start with some really good news because I like it when Christians win. So let's do it. Really, really, really good. That's really good news. It's good. Yes, I love when Christians win, and I am talking about now two-time Masters champion Scotty Scheffler, who has decided to dedicate his second, or maybe both, but this win, his second Masters Golf Tournament win to God. Quote, my victory was secure on the cross. Before we get to the article and what he said, I just want to tell you that this is how you're going to have to face the world and its craziness, Christian, because it can depress you. It can make you feel like there's no hope. I know we're in election year, and a lot of us are putting our hopes on, what is it, November 5th this year or whatever. Your hope has to be on the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross 2,000 years ago. Because I believe, with all of my heart, that no matter what the world is doing, God's people can be growing, can be fulfilling their purpose, and can be succeeding in life as they surrender their heart, their purpose, their plan, their future, and even their past to Jesus Christ. Anyway, Scotty Scheffler is a strong Christian, and he says this in this article from the Christian Post. I was sitting around with my buddies this morning. I was a bit overwhelmed, the 27-year-old said Sunday, after becoming the 10th golfer in history to win two green jackets in three years. I told him, I wish I didn't want to win as badly as I did or as badly as I do. I think it would make the mornings easier. I love winning. I hate losing. I really do. And when you're here in the biggest moments, when I'm sitting there with the lead on Sunday, I really, really want to win badly. And then look at this quote. This is great. My buddies told me this morning, my victory was secure on the cross. Ooh, I love that. And he said, that's... That's a pretty special feeling to know that I'm secure forever, and it doesn't matter if I win this tournament or lose this tournament. My identity is secure forever. I believe that today's plans were already laid out many years ago, and I could do nothing to mess those plans up. I've been given a gift of this talent, and I use it for God's glory. That's pretty much it. So when I'm out there, I try to compete to the best of my abilities. I feel like that's how I was designed at the end of the day. My identity is secure already. Wow. Yes. That's how you win, Christian. When you know that your identity in Christ is fixed is sealed, is certain. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he died and rose again? Have you repented of your sins? Have you turned to him for leading and guiding and direction in your life? My friend, if that is the case, you got nothing to worry about. So I say that and start the show tonight with the good news because I've got to talk about taxes. I've got to talk about what's going on in your world and how the government is wasting your money. And the rest of the show might be a bit depressing if you aren't secure in Christ. And so maybe it could be good because if you're not secure in Christ and you see how much, how terrible the government is doing for you, you'll turn to Christ. That's my hope anyway. Do you know that the average American, the average American will give one third of their lifetime income to the government in taxes? The average lifetime tax bill right there on the screen there is $524,625. New Jersey residents pay almost a million dollars in taxes over the course of their life. They are the highest state by far. West Virginians pay only about $360,000. So hoo Let's move to West Virginia, shall we? Now, remember, the government takes all this money and then they give $700 payments to the residents in Maui who lost their homes after they burned to the ground, but give illegal aliens thousands of dollars to come into this country illegally and to be housed and to be fed and to be clothed and to get health care. That is your government money at work. 
And I'm not buying the happy talk about paying taxes from one Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks. He went on X the other day and talked about how honored he felt to give the government almost $278 million of his money. It is just wonderful. Do I expect them to use it wisely? Of course not. It is just a privilege to give. <laughs> Baloney, Mark. I don't believe that for a second. The internet is forever. And that's what's so wonderful about it, because I've got this video here of Mark being interviewed. Uh, I don't know who this is interviewing him, but it is classic because Mark is sitting there saying, oh, yeah, Trump paid no taxes in uh, 2004 or 20, whatever it was. That's great. Watch. And you, I have one more for you, the Trump tax returns. Uh -huh. What was your reaction when you saw? Good for returns? him. Yeah, good for him. Like I said up there, if you made $150 million in a year, that's good no matter what. <laughs> yeah, so the internet is forever. You can't say one thing five years ago and then change your mind, or seven years ago now, and then change your mind simply because the political talking points have taken control of your mind and your heart and your senses. So what does our money pay for? Well, it's funding a endless war in Ukraine right now. It's funding the war in Gaza. It's even funding the weapons that are being shot into Israel. And we need to talk about that. And that brings me to Deep End News. Deep, 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 deep End News. The news you choose if you could choose news. So the war in Gaza rages on now for six months. We just passed that date uh, last week. It's been six plus months going where Israel was attacked savagely on October 7th of 2023. They have retaliated. They are um, continuing their attack. There are still hostages held in Gaza. It is a terrible situation. Prayers for Israel, prayers for all people that they would live in peace. We pray for the leaders in Gaza, that they would come to their senses, that they would stop, you know, sponsoring terrorism and, and uh, having it in their charter to ob obliterate Israel from the, from the map, okay? We pray for the peace of all people. We pray for the gospel to reach Jews, Gentiles, Gazans, Iranians, Egyptians, everyone. That's the heart of the church. So this past weekend, Iran got in on the fight. They shot, according to the New York Times, more than 300 drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles by, uh, from Iran were shot into uh, Israel in a full-scale military attack by Tehran. Around 99% of the projectiles were in intercepted by the Iron Dome, this amazing missile defense system that covers the Israeli sky uh, from north to south and makes sure that these these barrages do not hit civilians. Only one seven-year-old girl was severely injured in her head, and I believe an airstrip was also uh, damaged in the attack. But not much disaster, not much destruction, a pales in comparison to the October 7th Hamas attacks. So Iran um, decided to attack Israel for this reason. Uh, evidently, last month, Israel had targeted an Iranian embassy holding some terrorists and they attacked in Syria last month, so Iran had to do a face-saving a face targeting of Israel, and that's why it happened. So just so you know, I'm here to give you facts, give you details on all that happens uh, in the geopolitical spectrum, particularly when it concerns Israel, because Christians have to follow Israel. We do. We have to understand and Israel is the fig tree that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24. We've got to watch for its leaves to bud, then sprout, and then we know that the end is near. And so far, all that Jesus talked about concerning the state of Israel in the end times is coming to pass. So, like I said, Israel was, uh, Iran was attacked by Israel in a strike, and so they sought to save face for their citizens and to claim, you know, big boy pants status and strike back. They did call for permission or at least inform our president that they were going to attack Israel. I think they also called Israel to attack to let them know they were going to attack. Uh, it is basically just a big face-saving mission, just so you know, full disclosure here. Um, what we also should understand is that Hamas is rooting it on. They expressed support for Iran's attack on Israel this weekend, called it a divert, calling it a deserved response to the attack in Syria. Officials from the rebel Houthi group in Yemen congratulated Iran while downplaying their own involvement. Hagari said some UAVs and cruise missiles were launched from Yemen. So the nations are coming against Israel again and again. Uh, I need to remind you that this very small size of the uh, this very small nation, the size of New Jersey, is surrounded by enemies on every side. Uh, nations that used to have many, many Jews, thousands upon thousands of Jews, no longer have hardly any Jews because they are that anti-Semitic. They hate 
the Jewish people, and they are vicious enemies. Many of these countries also have it in their charters or in their constitutions to obliterate and attack Israel's Israel or Jews in general, and yet this country miraculously manages to survive while being surrounded by terror on every side. So my admonition first to you is, would you pray for them? Would you lift them up to God? The scripture says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we are called to support the Jews because as Paul says in Romans, that they are the root from which we come. We are grafted into the vine and we have to thank God for them because they brought us the Bible. They brought us the prophets. They brought us the covenants. They brought us Jesus and our salvation is due to the Jews. Now, obviously God used the Jews to bring all about all that about, but we as Christians have to continue to support and pray for them as well as for the peace of all people. Now, how does Iran find the money to attack Israel like this? 300 drones some of them the size of a school bus. This is not small potatoes military armament. Well, your government, through your tax dollars, continues to fund Iranian terrorism. Iran is a state sponsor of terrorism. They they back people financially to attack other nations. Now, I'm probably going to get some kind of notice on the bottom of this video screen on YouTube, because YouTube stinks, that I am telling you lies, but it's true. Because the White House and... The Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, Anthony Blinken, wants to tell you that, you know, this is not fungible funds. Fungible means that if your mom gives you $5 for soda, you go to the store and you buy baseball cards instead of soda. What you did, you funged the money. You used money that was for a soda for something else. Now, our government keeps telling us that though they keep releasing all of this money, all these monies that are held and sanctioned because Iran is a state sponsor of terrorism. Though they keep releasing the money, i.e. Biden and Obama and some by Trump, by the way, though they keep releasing all these funds to Iran, Iran is not funding the money and using it for terrorism. No, they've got to rebuild roads. They've got to build schools and hospitals. <laughs> no, that is not the case. This New York Post article highlights that. The White House was ripped over sanctions waiver that critics say put billions of dollars into Iran's hand. Last month, the White House extended this waiver. It unlocked, look at this, $10 billion in frozen funds, enabling Iraq to pay the Iranian government for electricity services, according to critics in the Washington Free Beacon. The Biden administration had already renewed the waiver program, which was established in 2018 in November. The extended waiver was then set to expire again in March, but the administration reapproved it once more just six weeks after three U.S. service members were killed and dozens more injured in a drone attack by Iran-backed militants in Jordan in late January. So this is what happens. America sanctions these countries because they are state sponsors of terrorism. And then they say, well, I guess you can have some money back, but but use it for roads. And then we trust these terrorists to use it for roads and they don't. So this meme online really sums it up. My tax dollars are part of the Iron Dome that helps support Israel's protection. And then somehow my tax dollars are also coming in the form of drone missiles from Iran and other terrorist regimes across the Middle East. And this matters for Christians and Bible prophecy, and I want to give you some facts about that as well. A couple things you need to know, uh, Christians. Did you know that it was only as recent as 1939 that Iran had changed its name to Iran from Persia? The the reason why is because they wanted to have a new beginning, and for a a good portion of the 20th century, Iran was a partner for peace for uh, with the West and. They were actually partners and teammates with the United States up until the late 1970s. All that changed, of course, with the emergence of Islam in the region and their uh, continued hatred for the Jews. But Persia, that's an interesting name for Christians. You need to know your Bible. And I bring you to Ezekiel chapter 38, which talks about Gog and Magog, whom God would raise up to attack Israel from the north. And then it lists five other Nations And one of those nations in verse 5 of Ezekiel 38 is Persia, along with Cush, Put, and then uh, Gomer and Beth Togorma. And all those names might not seem like anything to you, but God says, I'm going to raise you up in the end times. I'm going to send you to attack my people Israel. And then this is going to be a trap for you. This is how Israel eventually will win. And I believe uh, Jesus Christ will conquer. He will will come back when all this uh, military... Uh, activity in the Middle East comes to a head against Israel. 
Here's how God unpacks that in Ezekiel 38. But on that day, verse 18, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord, my wrath will be browsed in my anger. Verse 21, I will summon a sword against Gog. Oh, by the way, just so you know, Gog means leader and Magog means people. So this could just be like a general, you know, prophecy about there will be a powerful leader north of Israel who will lead a group of people to attack Israel. Many theologians believe this would be a Vladimir Putin type character, if not Vladimir Putin himself and Russia, although that has yet to be seen in any way. Nonetheless, you could consider a successor to Vladimir Putin being an anti-Semite and being sick of the U.S.'s involvement in the Middle East, which upends Russia's, you know, gas pipeline. And so you could see the retaliation coming from either Putin or someone who succeeds Putin. And this will all be, I remind you, according to Ezekiel 38, a trap set by God to bring about the final battle uh, in Israel's history right around the return of Jesus Christ. Anyway, going back to Ezekiel 38, he says, I will summon a sword against Gog, that is leader, on all my mountains, declares the Lord, every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain upon him and his hordes and many peoples who are with him torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. These are all pictures of the plagues in uh, Revelation, by the way. So I will show my greatness and my holiness, and I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Exciting times if you consider what the Bible says about these areas. Now, this is the map, okay, of Israel. There it is in the lower center portion of this greater like European all the way over to Asia, Russia to the north, Africa to the south. They are like the center of the world, are they not? And, and, and there's Iran over to the east of them, Russia to the north. This attack, by the way, mentioned in Ezekiel, comes from the north. And these nations, this is the modern name of these nations. Let me put this next map up. These are the biblical areas mentioned in Ezekiel 38. So Rosh could, re could refer to Russia, Magog, the peoples of the former Soviet Union, if you will. Togomar and Tubal could be Turkey. Persia, we know, is Iran. Egypt is absolutely um, related to Kush in the Bible. Put is Libya, and Gomer is from the Eastern European nations. And God says, I'm going to take all those nations that surround Israel like that, and I'm going to bring them against my people. And it's going to look bad for my people. The nation will be surrounded by armies. By the way, Jesus says in Luke 21, verse 20, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its destruction has come near. He's talking about the armies of Rome in AD 70 that will destroy the city and obliterate it for 2,000 years until it's rebuilt and, and and now back to a nation state in 1948. But I also believe he's talking about an end time surrounding of the nation. And it will look like its destruction is near. But God will bring about a redemption. Later in that same chapter in Luke, Jesus says there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and the earth, the stress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves. Sounds like climate change. And people fainting with fear, with foreboding of what is coming on the world. That sounds like depression, anxiety to the point that people want to commit suicide. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And now look at this, verse 28, Christians, look at this. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. We do not throw up our hands and say, oh my goodness, what's going on? Our country is funding the terrorists. Our country is funding the people being terrorized. Our country is wasting our tax dollars. We don't get upset. We raise up our heads. We look to the heavens. Our redemption is drawing near. Jesus is in charge. Can I get a good amen in the comments? Meanwhile, what's happening in our country is a little bit more disconcerting as we see Palestinian protesters are blocking airports right now in major cities. Some travelers are being forced to walk over a mile to get to their plane on time. Now watch this video as we get to the end of it here and you will see your tax dollars at work once again because and I'm just going to I'm just going to fast forward here. You're going to see at the end of this video there it is. Police officers standing there doing nothing. Why? <laughs> Why are our publicly funded police officers in, I believe this is New York on the way to LaGuardia, allowing these protesters to disrupt traffic? Imagine if you had to take a flight for a funeral. Imagine if you had to take a flight for a wedding and you couldn't get there because pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas protesters are stopping traffic to the airport. Also in another left-wing bastion, San Francisco is seeing protesters are blocking the Golden Gate Bridge in support of Gaza. 
This is pro-Palestinian protesters all over our nation, particularly in deep blue liberal cities. And then this past weekend in New York, flag burning. Unbelievable. Is this a third world country? Is this the Middle East? No. Death to America. Chanted on the streets of America. Here's another video of a burning flag. And I'm sorry to all the veterans that might offend you, might trigger you. I'm so sorry. We thank God for your contribution to protecting our freedoms. But this is what we are seeing happening. Rise up. This, this spirit of anti-Semitism. This spirit of anti-Jewish bias. All over our country, particularly in blue strangleholds. Blue strongholds of our Populist, watch this video. What do you think about the burning the American flag? I love it. Burn it down. Burn it again and again and again. This is outside the the um, New York Stock Exchange. A Hezbollah flag is being waved. Hezbollah is a terrorist regime <laughs> from Lebanon. I'm always a little bit amused at the number of pro-Hamas, pro-Palestinian protesters and marchers who are masked up. Let's go back to this video. They're all wearing masks. <laughs> They're so brave, they have to wear masks outside four years after the COVID pandemic. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Florida, this is how you do it right. Florida is a deep red state with a conservative governor who does not tolerate the disruption of the civil order. And so he orders the police and and uh, uh, city leaders also ordering the police across the state of Florida to do the right thing. Clear out the protesters, remove them from blocking traffic, and help the city function. That's what you're supposed to do. But once again, New York will be heavily Democratic in this upcoming election, and they, they don't care. They just watch themselves, experience the judgment of God, and they just keep voting for the same kind of leaders. Let's not forget about how the government funds the news industry. Do you understand why deep end news is so important? Because I bring you the news that they don't want you to see. This brings me to NPR. NPR, if you don't know, is publicly funded radio. It's called National Public Radio NPR. But I would wish that they would call themselves PFP, as in publicly funded propaganda. They take your tax dollars and they put news over the airwaves that give you a severe slanted bias. And they have shifted radically left ever since Trump became president in 2016. There's an interesting article over at the Free Press by an a senior business editor named Yuri Berliner, or Berliner, I think it's Yuri Berliner. The title of the article, I've been at NPR for 25 years. Here's how we lost America's trust. He says in the article, you know, I, you know the stereotype of the NPR listener, the EV driving, worldly playing, tote bag carrying, coastal elite. It doesn't precisely describe me, but it's not far off. I'm a Sarah Lawrence educated, raised by a lesbian peace activist mother. I drive a Subaru and Spotify says my listening habits are mostly similar to people in Berkeley. I fit the NPR mold. I'll cop to that. So when I got the job 25 years ago, I never looked back. A senior editor on the business desk where news is always breaking. We've covered upheavals in, world play, in the workplace, supermarket prices, social media, and AI. It's true NPR has always had a liberal bent, but during most of my tenure here, an open-minded, curious culture prevailed. We were nerdy, but not knee-jerk activists or scolding. In recent years, however, that has changed. Today, those who listen to NPR or read its coverage online find something different. The distilled worldview of a very small segment of the U.S. population. Now he goes on and he talks about the fact that in 2011, NPR's audience tilted a bit to the left, but it still bore a resemblance to America at large. 26 people describe themselves who listen to NPR describe themselves as conservative, 23 as middle of the road, and 37% as liberal. In 2003, the picture was completely different. Only 11% Describe themselves as somewhat or very conservative, 21% middle, and 67% said they were somewhat or very liberal. We weren't just losing conservatives, we were also losing moderates and traditional liberals. An open-minded spirit no longer exists within NPR, and now predictably, we don't have an audience that reflects uh, America. He talks about the fact that it all started with the rise of Donald Trump in many newsrooms. His election was greeted with a mixture of disbelief. Anger, despair, just a note, I eagerly voted against Trump twice, but felt we were obliged to cover him fairly. But what began as tough, straightforward coverage of a belligerent, truth-impaired president veered towards efforts to damage or tumple, topple Trump's presidency. Persistent rumors that Trump's campaign colluded with Russia over the election 
became the catnip that drove reporting. At NPR, we hitched our wagon to Trump's most visible antagonist, Representative Adam Schiff. Schiff, who was on the top who was the top Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, became NPR's guiding hand, its ever-present muse. By my count, NPR host, hosts interviewed Schiff 25 times about Trump and Russia. During many of those conversations, Schiff alluded to purported evidence of collusion. The Schiff talking points became the drumbeat of NPR news reports. But when the Mueller report found no credible evidence of collusion, NPR's coverage was notably sparse. Russiagate quietly faded from our programming. Then in October 2020, the New York Post published the explosive report about the Hunter Biden laptop, abandoned at a Delaware computer shop containing emails about assorted business dealings with the election only weeks away. NPR turned a blind eye. Here's how NPR's managing editor for the news at the time explained the thinking, quote, we don't want to waste our time on stories that are not really stories, and we don't want to waste the listeners' and readers' times on stories that are just pure distraction. But it wasn't a pure distraction or a product of Russian disinformation. A dozen of, a, as dozens of former and current intelligence officials suggested, the laptop did belong to Hunter Biden. Its contents revealed its connections to the corrupt world of multi- million dollar influence peddling and his possible implications for his father. The laptop was newsworthy, but the timeless journalistic instinct of following a hot story lead was being squelched. During a meeting with colleagues, I listened as one of NPR's best and most fair-minded journalists said it was it was good we weren't following the laptop story because it could help Trump. This, friends, is National Public Radio. Your tax dollars at work making sure that you don't get the news that you should have. Even if it's true, even if it's fact based, he goes on. He talks about the politics that intruded in NPR's newsroom concerning COVID. He says COVID coverage, most notably in the reporting of the origin of the pandemic. One of the most dismal aspects of COVID journalism is how quickly it faded to ideological storylines. For example, there was the Team Natural Origin supporting the hypothesis that the virus came from a wild animal market in Wuhan, and on the other side, Team Lab Link, Lab Link leaning into the idea that the virus escaped from a Wuhan lab. The lab leak theory came in for rough treatment almost immediately, dismissed as racist, which I don't understand, <laughs> or a white right-wing conspiracy theory. Anthony Fauci and former NIH head Francis Collins, representing the public health establishment, were its most notable critics, and that was enough for NPR. We became fervent members of Team Natural Origin, even declaring that the lab leak had been debunked by scientists when it had not. He goes on, and I encourage you to read the entire article one last bit about NPR's degener uh, degeneracy over the last, what, eight years now. DEI has infiltrated the hiring procedure. He says race and identity became paramount in every aspect of the workplace. Journalists were required to ask everyone we interviewed their race, gender, and ethnicity, among other questions, and had to enter into a centralized tracking system. That's just scary. <laughs> we were given unconscious bias training sessions. A growing DEI staff ordered regular meetings imploring us to talk about to start talking about race. Monthly dialogues were offered for women of color and men of color. Non-binary people of color were included too. These initiatives, bolstered by a $1 million grant from the NPR Foundation, your tax dollars, came from management from the top down. Crucially, they were in sync culturally with what was happening at the grassroots among producers, reporters, and other staffers. Most visible was a burgeoning number of employee research, resource or affinity groups based on identity. So this guy gets on the free press, uh, started by Barry Weiss, a former uh, New York Times liberal journalist. And basically exposes NPR's left-wing bias with evidence, with, with truth, with facts. And guess what happened to him? <laughs> this morning I found out that he has been suspended from NPR after 25 years simply for sharing concerns about bias in the free press. Oh, and by the way, the new NPR uh, leader or president, if you will, is Catherine Meyer. And her old tweets are surfacing thanks to Christopher Rufo on X. Tweets like, Oscar so far, rapey, racist, and misogynistic, and oddly meta-comfortable with it. Or, why creeping Sharia, that is Sharia law from the Islamic world, would support universal health care, education, a woman's right to choose, and perhaps gay marriage. <laughs> 2012. Talk about, talk about being so open-minded your brain has literally fallen out. To think that Sharia law would support a woman's right to choose... Or gay marriage <laughs> when Islamic nations <laughs> kill uh, women for not dressing modestly enough and throw homosexuals off of buildings just because they're gay. <laughs> Talk about being insane. She also tweeted out in 2020, I grew up feeling superior. Ha, how white of me because I was from New England and my part of the country didn't have slaves, so I'd been taught. 
That's the new head of the N- of NPR. That that is f- a woman that is paid for by you. You are paying her salary, and that's where your tax dollars are going. I don't want you to. Dep- I don't want to depress you, but we have to go on. Your tax dollars are all- also going to work with Joe Biden buying votes from the kiddies. Yes, he has been all over the campaign trail since he started running for president because he knew he had to get the young vote. And so he promised loan forgiveness. And that is air quotes on purpose because there's no such thing as loan forgiveness when it comes to government funded loans. That is taking money from hardworking Americans and giving it to people who took out a loan from the government and now cry that they're poor because they can't afford their mochaccino from Starbucks and pay their student loans back. Here's Biden saying just that. Today, I'm proud to announce five major actions to continue to relieve student debt for more than 30 million Americans since this I started my administration. And starting this fall, we plan to deliver up to $20,000 in interest relief to over 20 million borrowers and full forgiveness for millions more. I will never stop to deliver student debt relief on hardworking Americans, and it's only in the interest of America that we do it. And again, it's for the good of our economy that's growing stronger and stronger, and it is. By freeing millions of Americans from this crushing debt of student debt, it means they can finally get on with their lives. Yeah. Um, how are you feeling about the economy? Because the overall sentiment is it's not good. And most Americans believe that Trump could do a better job with the economy by far if he was to be reelected in 2024. Although with his hush money payment court case starting yesterday and probably continuing until June or so. He's got to be in court every day, four days a week for the next four months to keep him off the campaign trail. But everything's kosher there. That's not that's not political persecution by our government against a political candidate that is opposing our current president. No, no, no. That's just justice. We got people running rampant and punching women in the face in New York City. And the justice that the New York leaders are interested in is putting a former president behind bars for paying a porn star hush money. <laughs> okay, that's our world. So Biden promises student loan relief. Now a new uh, move has provided relief for 277,000 borrowers, $7.4 billion, in spite of the fact that the Supreme Court struck this move down as unconstitutional. Biden gets the Democratic privilege of saying, There is no such thing as check and balances, checks and balances when you're a Democrat. I get to do whatever I want. Now, Phil Kirpin on X has reported that, according to a Penn Wharton study, Biden's new student loan plan will cost taxpayers another $84 billion, bringing bringing the total out-of-pocket expense to taxpayers to almost, no, over a half trillion dollars, $559 billion. The biggest winners are 750,000 people with 20 years in repayment. Their average debt relief is $25,000 plus. And the average household income of these people is $312,000 a year. Now, I don't know if you have a problem with people who make $312,000 a year getting free money from the government, but I do. Why should plumbers, why should carpenters, why should skilled tradesmen and women have to pay for some coastal elite with a degree in lesbian dance theory from whatever college to not have to pay back the loan that you took out to take the use to find to to get the useless degree this is insanity insanity the bible says the wicked borrow and do not repay you should be paying back what you owe that is a scriptural principle even romans chapter 12 says it in the new testament so we have ample evidence biblically that this is wrong this is an anti-biblical stance and move by our president And Christians, more and more, you've got to take note of what this guy does because he is by far the most anti-biblical, the most anti-Christian president I think I've ever seen in my life, maybe in the history of our country. But a good question about the student loan relief promise that Joe Biden keeps campaigning on with your tax money, this is the good question we need to ask. How did we get here? In other words, how did we get to the point where you... As a uh, American teenager, go to a high school, public high school, most likely, and desire to go to college based on the promise that if you get a college degree, you'll make lots of money and the American dream will be yours. Just get that all-powerful college degree and everything will take care of itself, which is a total lie, by the way. I have many millionaires in my church 
that did not get a college degree, many of them dropped out <laughs> and they are tremendously successful people. College education is not what they say it is. In fact, just as a side note here, I didn't have this in my notes for the show, uh, plumbers can often make six-figure salaries fresh out of trade school. Yeah, because nobody wants to work with people's crap. So the money's there. And maybe if you put your hands in the crap, you'll find some money there as well for you. <laughs> but how did we get here where you have presidents now campaigning on the promise to cancel your student loan debt? Like, how did that happen that the, the kiddos are in such debt? Well, the real culprit was President Obama. Back in 2010, Obama eliminated the Federal Guaranteed Loan Program, which allowed private lenders to offer student loans at low interest rates. The Department of Education was now completely in charge of college loans. By the way, Bill Clinton made it all possible for direct loans from the government back in 1993. Obama basically eliminated the private sector from the loan process. There was a time, kiddos, when banks could compete for loaning you money with federal security and they could offer you lower interest rates than the other bank, but the government said, boo, that's capitalism, that's competition. Let's take charge and make it better. And by the way, they've made it far worse, as often happens with the government. So two things happen. When the government said no to private bankers funding college education, the government, the government first made loans easier to get, but not cheaper. And then student loan debt skyrocketed, and by 2015, almost 30% of borrowers were in default. Almost all of it owed to the federal government, which already started putting in provisions to help forgive the debt when the time was right. Like, oh, I don't know, during an election season. Students with debt are now just another welfare group that will overwhelmingly vote Democrat in hopes that all their financial prom problems will be solved by a stroke of a pen of a president. Now, this was reported in Fox News when it happened. When it happened back in 2015, Charles Payne on Fox News said the following, this clip needs to go viral on the internet. Watch this. I want you to take a look at what's actually looming. Of the $1.3 trillion in student loan debt outstanding, we are on the hook for $800 billion. When President Obama came into office, it was less than $100 billion. By the way, everyone's uh, gonna be involved. Remember, the president launched the direct launch, the student loan program. It's, it's working for him, not working for us. And this whole thing in my mind is just a bald-faced attempt to buy votes, even at the expense of a lot of people who didn't go to college. You didn't go to college. So what? If you're paying taxes, you're on the hook, too. I guess it's the definition of fair. Now, here's a key, and I think this is what we're going to look back on now that we've opened Pandora's box. Remember, they're developing a process. Now, there's no doubt this is going to be the mechanism that's used to forgive non-for-profit loans, schools, even Ivy League schools. That's going to be the key, and it will be used, and it will win elections. All right, guys. Wow. Talk about prophetic by Charles Payne. By the way, he has a book out. I, I encourage you to read his book. That is amazing. Back in 2015, nine years ago, Charles Payne saw that the Obama stroke of the pen that removed private sector funding for college education and handing it all over to the government would be a tool eventually that would be used to dangle the bait in front of voters to say, well, I know we got you into this huge mess with high pay interest payments. Now let us help you get out of the mess. Vote for us. It's unbelievable, the bait-and-switch tactics of the corrupt politicians on the political left. I'm not saying that the political right is right by any st stretch of the imagination, but it's astounding how none of this is ever reported. We just continue to say, more government, please, as the government continues to ruin people's lives. Oh, and by the way, back in 2013, a Tennessee Republican named Larry Lamar Alexander highlighted the fact that the interest payments for student loans would go to be used for paying for Obamacare, another government intrusion into our lives by making health care more expensive despite all the claims to the contrary at the time of its initiation. So, if you're not keeping track, the federal student loan program has made, number one, college more expensive. Because if you subsidize federally loan, if you just open up the government pay wallet to pay for school schools, the schools say, well, now we can charge more because the kids can take out more loans. So college is more expensive. Number two, interest rates on those loans are higher than they need to be. And number three, health care is more expensive as well. So kiddos, you're getting it from both ends from the government. And when, when, I wonder, will you wake up, young people, when will you wake up and realize that the government does not have your best interest in mind? They never have. 
the government should be doing a few things right, like, you know, building roads and protecting our borders. But they're not interested in doing any of that. The government is like the, <laughs> um, the woman in misery <laughs> who comes with the gun, the shotgun and the injection and says, or who comes with the gun and the injection and says, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that is the government. Who is that actress, by the way? I can't remember her name. Oh, it went in my head, not my head. What's her name? I can't remember. Anyway, you know her name. Put it in the comments. Let me know. What the government is not paying for with your tax, tax dollars is what they should be doing, like closing our border. And this is probably the worst news of the lot. This video is making the rounds on the internet from the Darien Gap. The Darien Gap is this very uh, difficult to transver transverse area in Panama where migrants come from South America through Panama, through the Darien Gap, find uh, very strategically placed housing facilities funded by our government to make sure that their trek through that dangerous Darien Gap is safe enough for them to make it all the way to our country. Yes. That's your tax paying dollars at work. Somebody went down to the Gar Panama Gap and filmed the Darien Gap and filmed these immigrants as they are coming in, these illegals, these invaders. And this video will shock you. Here's what they said. Hey, amigos, so, <laughs> ¿qué país? ¿Qué país? Venezuela. Venezuela. Venezuela y a dónde vas? A uh, USA. Para tu país. Estados Unidos. <laughs> Por Estados Unidos. Claro. No, ¿por, qué, ¿Por qué vas a Estados Unidos? ¿Por qué no vas a Canadá o otro país? Porque ya está el billete. ¿Por billete? ¿Ah? Por billete. Por plata. ¿O por plata? Claro. Ok, ok, ok. ¿Y a qué parte en Estados Unidos? Depende, Texas o Miami. ¿O opinión del de presidente Biden? Excelente. Excelente. Que ojalá no reciba todo, pues. Que nos dé la oportunidad de trabajar. So again, these are facilities that the government puts up so that they can make it through. Ni hao. Ni hao. You go America? Yeah. There they go. Headed to our country with protections by our government. Nothing to see here. YouTube will probably take this video down. That's what's going on in the Darien Gap in Panama and it's funded by your tax dollars. My, meanwhile, Libs with TikTok reporting that this flyer has been found at porta potties along the pathway to America. And in these flyers, you have the Todos con Biden, all for Biden or all with Biden. And the wording there in Spanish says the following, reminder to vote for President Biden when you are in the United States, we need another four years of his term to stay open. These flyers were found all up and down the Darien Gap. And I have a video showing you the location of them. Watch this. There it is right there. Now. Now, some are going to say, but illegals can't vote. Um, <laughs> first, no one knows if they can or cannot, okay? Voter ID is not required in many left-wing blue states. Number two, you get a work visa, you get a social security number, and you can register to vote, and it's not that hard. And number three, they're voting. No matter what anybody tells you, they're voting. Uh, this video is also making the rounds where we have a inordinate number of Chinese men coming into our country through the southern border, and one who has to wonder, how is this happening? Why from China? And why are they all military-aged men? And why are they all without families? Watch. A message to Alejandro Mayorkas. We are in the migrant camp of San Vicente. The majority right here on the back, all of them are from China. 
as they are migrating into the northern borders of the United States. Venezuela, China, 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 Venezuela, 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 China. Why do you see no children? United States, United States, USA. Where are you going? USA, USA. This is China. Yes, from China. China. Where are you going to the United States? USA. 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 America, not New York. America, New York. Uh, yes. Yes. Xi Jinping. No. No. Okay. USA. China. 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 Nepal. China. 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 Oh, you China. 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 Yeah. China. 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 And China. Okay, you get the point. This is an invasion. This this is not people seeking asylum. This is not seeking people seeking a better thing for their families. These these this is crazy. And our government is using their tax dollars to make sure that it can continue to happen. And my, by the way, what's coming across the border? Remember when Trump was excoriated as a horrible, vicious racist for saying they weren't sending their best? They were sending drugs. They are sending drugs. Even CNN has to report this. Fentanyl is a dominant, uh, Mexico, sorry. Mexico is a dominant source of fentanyl trafficked into the U.S. Fentanyl, a type of synthetic opioid, has been a primary driver of the U.S. opioid epidemic and is 50 times more potent than heroin, according to the report. It found that while 70 to 80 percent of fentanyl that federal government, federal authorities seized between uh, roughly 2014 and 2019 had come from China, Mexico is now the dominant source of fentanyl in the U.S. Fentanyl is trafficked principally by land across US's, the U.S.'s southern border with Mexico through cartels. Though cartels have also increased the use of the U.S. Postal Service, the report said. And what is fentanyl capable of doing? Well, it's just capable of killing billions of people. This is from the center square. Uh, Tucson CBP agents seizing enough fentanyl meth to kill billions of people. The drugs are being hidden in microwaves, in children's bouncy houses, and under watermelons. In one of the busiest sectors of our border, agents seized more than 38,500 pounds of drugs in 2021. By the way, two milligrams of fentanyl is enough to kill a person. And this is why... More and more bad news. The U.S. deaths due to fentanyl nearly quadrupled in the last five years. That's according to Health Day News. The 12-month ending provisional number of per- and percent percent change of drug overdose is astronomically higher since 2015. And by the way, notice the large uptick surge from around November 2020 when Joe Biden was elected. Friends, it does not give me pleasure to tell you these things, but you need to know them. Biblically speaking, I say this nation is under judgment. Pastorally speaking, I say to you, lift up your eyes, see what's happening in the Middle East, know that your redemption is drawing nigh. And politically speaking, I say, if we have four more years of this, our nation is not going to last. It's just not. And that is the end of our free content tonight, guys. I hope it's been helpful to you, informative. I hope it has helped you to discern the times in which you live. Now, if you are interested in being a member of the Dependables, these are the people who financially support this content, consider signing up today over at patreon.com slash Tim Hatch Live. We have a lot of fun, and I wanted to share with you a video of our behind-the-scenes footage to show you some of the stuff that you see here on the channel. Watch this. It feels like you take one week off and everything crazy happens. and right. The whole, no. the whole world changes. Uh. Crazy never stops, friends. Crazy never stops. That's the sinful condition. Keeps me gainfully employed. Amen, <laughs> amen, amen. <laughs> when Jesus returns, I'm out of a job. Thank God. <laughs> Cheryl and I both watched the video for two hours. Um, I watched everything on one and a half speed. Oh, by the way, that's why I talk so fast. Because everything <laughs> I listen to is one and a half speed. So I <laughs> it's in my brain. <laughs> Like, that's how you talk now. You have to talk at one half speed. That's how you talk. So anyway, and we want to talk about Lana Ray. So the reason why I want to talk about this girl, two hours interview with Michael Knowles, powerful, worth the watch on YouTube. I would check it out. It's best that we shun women like this from society forever. No. 
<laughs> so, so what I, happens with the I, Bible verse about you know, Jesus, you know releasing women from similar seeker sensitivity has to die it has to die now once and forever it was a failed experiment i can't think of very many things that have contributed positively to the church except for better music because it's all about having the kids feel good about themselves and as i shared in that you know uh commentary on abigail schreier's latest book the more the kids are told to walk to monitor their feelings and you know mind their feelings the worse off they are mm -hmm. okay that is some of the fun content some of the great content that we have for you behind the scenes as well as extra content right now for our membership community again patreon.com slash tim hatch live when you support us we support project rescue and the american bible society 20 percent of all that comes in goes out in the form of missionary giving and uh slave traffic freeing works across the world and oh, also, I know that it doesn't happen much anymore, but would you like the video, subscribe, and get notified through that notification bell on YouTube. I say it doesn't happen as much anymore because there is no doubt. Behind the scenes, we can see it. Suppression is a real thing, and YouTube does not like this content getting into your ears. But that is it. That is it for me tonight for the free content. Head over to the membership content right now to see what we got coming up. We got to talk about Mark Driscoll. We got to talk about uh, some other great news for Christians. Uh, one concerning an OnlyFans star who is now converted to Christianity, but she's getting some hate, and we're going to talk about that right now. Join us there. Love you. God bless.